Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. And as you can see, it's a beautiful morning here in New Zealand, which is kind of rare because it's actually winter down here while it's summer up there in the Northern Hemisphere. It's my 55th birthday today, and I thought, just for the occasion and just for some fun, I thought I would read to you the article that I wrote for New Zealand Musician Magazine called 25 Signs That You May Have Become a Professional Musician. Uh, it's kind of a light-hearted, but still, you know, with a serious message kind of article. And as I go through this article, I'll just give you some perspective on how those signs relate to my own career and, you know, and how they might relate to yours as well. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so New Zealand Musician Magazine is a online journal for New Zealand musicians of the popular music field. So it's not really, you know, an all universal encompassing kind of magazine, although I've done one or two articles there that talk about orchestration for crossover groups and so on. Um, <clears throat> so this article was written about um, almost four years ago, and it was really targeted, as I say, at uh, popular musicians. And there are quite a few professional musicians in New Zealand who are, you know, just basically living off of their wits and living, you know, day to day and gig to gig. And <clears throat> I write an article called Building Blocks, and this is one of those articles. And I can basically, it's fun, I can just basically write whatever I like for this article. And sometimes I talk about, um, you know, gigging, you know, what kind of gigs can you get, how do you get paid, and things like that, that reflect from when I was between the ages of 16 and 25, and I was heavily involved in popular music, and I was writing a lot of pop songs and working with a lot of bands, eventually producing, as well as gigging in clubs and doing other things. So, I mean, I'm not saying that I had this really huge career or anything, but I just had a very practical career, sort of like now, uh, in orchestration, where I'm doing real gigs that pay money that I can use to feed my family. And actually, back then, with the gigging I was doing, I was able to help my mom pay rent on her house, for instance, and, and buy groceries and so on and so forth. So, you know... I mean, I wasn't touring with Iggy Pop as his keyboardist, but I was, you know, still paying the bills. And that's actually what I find practical experience is much more important for a developing musician than like the perspective from on high. You know what I mean? Um, because generally people who are working at the very, very top of the field have like no time to talk to you. And they might have tons of information that, you know, that would help your career, but they just, you know, they they just really physically and in terms of the calendar don't have the time to sit down and talk to you about it. So sometimes it's better to talk to somebody who is sort of doing the work but has a little bit of extra time to chat with you, which is what this whole channel is about, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to read this article to you and then just make comments as I go. And if you just, you know, if you are completely fed up with my BS, then you can just jump to the link below and read the article and then listen to the rest of this uh, probably going to be a very long video <clears throat> as we go. But anyways, it's my birthday, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> For most musicians, the road to a viable career is gradual, not instantaneous. You get there by baby steps, by continued presence in your scene, and by the accumulation of experience and perspective. Eventually, you realize that you're earning most or all of your money because of your music. That essentially makes you a professional musician. But understanding this sometimes takes a while to get through your thick skull. So here is a list of traits that are common to most working musos. Everything on this list does not necessarily apply to every musician, but most players are bound to find some items that resonate, including orchestral musicians, which is, that is something that I added on at the end when I shared this on my own website, Orchestration Online. Number one, the never-ending story. Your music is the first thing you think about when you wake up and the last thing you think about when you go to sleep. In fact, you dream about playing gigs and you practice licks in your head while driving. Okay, so this actually happened to me. I would be driving around from student to student sometimes or just from place to place taking care of 
the stuff that I had to do in the day. And, you know, and I would just be thinking about, um, you know, just getting something right that I had to do for that night for some gig or some gig that I was going to be playing, some really big thing that I was going to be playing in a couple of days. So, uh, and I still do that today, but I don't, you know, obviously I'm not a gigging composer anymore. I'm a pro orchestrator. So I will be thinking about, you know, what, what I'm working on. And sometimes that's an original composition and I have a big storage space in my head. You know, I don't know how many gigabytes or terabytes it is, but I've got whole concertos stored up there, as some of you might remember when I released this article on Patreon about uh, being stuck in a hospital bed and having nothing to do, uh, not you know, no access to anything that I could write anything down or work on anything, and um, or even just you know read a book. So I just reviewed an entire concerto that I'm working on in my head. So anyway, um, you can read that if you'd like. I've also linked that below. Number two, you cut to the cash. The first thing you want to know when offered a gig is what it's paying. And the first thing you mention when asked to play for an event is your fee, and you know how to do this without sounding weird. Okay, now here's the thing is, that has to do with confidence, right? If you just are a confident professional musician, and people are hiring you for a gig, then it is only natural for you to ask how much it is paid. And in fact, if you ask that in a confident, friendly way, then um, people will respond and they'll tell you right away and they won't feel weird about it. So that is the trick to not sounding weird about asking, okay? And this is actually a problem with uh, developing composers who are becoming professional, is that just like, you know, and this is, fa in fact, this is one of the questions we get a lot on the Facebook group, Orchestration Online, and that is, you know, what I... I feel weird about asking for money for this, or I don't know how much I should ask, and, and so on. So basically, it just has to do with getting over feeling weird. That's, a, you know, the, the, you want to not sound weird, then stop feeling weird about it, okay? That's my advice. Okay, three, most of your friends are musicians. In fact, the friends you've got who aren't musicians are usually from way back in your past when you used to dream about playing in a band. So I'm actually finding that this is true with me. I must have like hundreds of friends on Facebook that I've made, you know, who I really, you know, share a lot of personal information and perspectives and hang out with a lot. And, um, you know, I mean, they're all musicians. It's very rare for me to make a friendship outside of my field now. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of like to try <laughs> sometimes, but... You know, when you're just focused 100% on music all the time, it's it's really hard to go out of your world and to talk about different things. And of course, I think that's actually good. It's good for you to be able to completely have a break from the music that you're doing and just communicate with people. But yeah, you know, I've got I've got friends from the old days, you know, who aren't musicians or you know might be peripherally um, associated with the arts or might be students who've gone on and no longer do music or, you know, people associated with my family and so on. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of people in my family that are artistic. My brother was a uh, pro musician and my sister was a music student when she was a teenager and, gosh, she was a fantastic musician, better than me <laughs> at performing. Number four, emergencies don't phase you. If something goes wrong, you know how to fix it because you've got backups and know-how. And if it can't be fixed, you know how to cancel or change plans without freaking out. Um, <laughs> um, I wish I could say that this was 100% correct because I had the most earth-shattering, career-shattering emergency last year. And it's held up a lot of things uh, that I owe the community, actually. Um, and I don't want to get into it right now, but yeah. But... <sighs> Yes, um, you know, much more so than if you were an amateur musician or a developing composer or whatever. If you run into an emergency and you're a pro and you've been around the block and you've dealt with them a few times, you know what to do, okay? And if you're a pro and you're getting enough income from it, then you can just fix the emergency by getting another piece of equipment, <laughs> okay? Which is the way I had to solve a few emergencies recently. Number five, you're tired of being admired. 
because at this point, you're starting to see that those who worship you have got no idea what it takes. Those who see you as an equal have more valuable things to tell you. Okay, and this is actually true to an extent, um, just like with me in in my group. You know, when people give me heaps of praise, I mean, that's that's wonderful. And I think people are expressing their gratitude for how much the resources that I have shared, which are, by the way, not all mine. It's also access to other great teachers and insights, you know, like those of Alan Belkin or Norm Ludwin or, you know, anybody else there who can interact with the group and contribute and so on and so forth. Okay, so, but people are expressing their appreciation for that. Um, and I really, I understand that and I accept it. And I am so glad that I can guide people in the right direction. But, you know, when people tell me that I'm some sort of, you know, incredible person, I just think I'm a, just a, I'm a gifted person and this is my passion. And I, I accept that part of the equation, but I mean, I'm, there is nothing special about me, okay? As I've said in my other video, A Composer Looks at 50, uh, which hmm, was five years ago when I was turning 50, um, you know, the people who are special out there are the people who have, like, no means of support other than their passion, okay? And, I mean, yeah, that is kind of true of me, too, but I have slowly built a network of clients and strategies and everything else. So I have a bunch of things to fall back on before my entire world falls apart. But, you know, in my opinion, the people who are the special ones are the ones who are just right out there on the edge of survival and are just putting everything into it. So so I appreciate the praise. I accept it wholeheartedly. And thank you so much for feeling inspired and for appreciating what I'm putting out here. But, you know, but I don't consider myself to be this incredible special person, okay? So, so anyways, and just, you know, don't call me maestro, don't call me professor, don't call me, you know, Herr Tomas, just, just call me Thomas, all right? And I just, because I just really love interacting with people and just bringing us all down to an equal level and everybody just chatting and everybody sharing perspectives and that makes everybody's perspective worthwhile and, and entertaining and engaging right? Instead of, you know, just one fat cat who is just spouting off incredible information and while everybody else has to sit there and say, yes, sir, right? I don't like that. Okay, number six, you eat like a scavenger. Scheduled meals are becoming a thing of the past, and you tend to eat while driving, reading, working on something, catching up with emails, or any other time you're not playing music with both hands. In my case, this is any time I'm not orchestrating <laughs> or some other kind of thing. Yes, I will grab a little bite to eat, sometimes a few more bites than necessary. Um, but yeah, that's what my new home gym is that I got for my birthday, yay. <laughs> so um, yeah, maybe I can get rid of this double chin. Uh, anyway, um, but yeah, uh, that is something that I noticed when I was gigging a lot was just, you know, I would be driving to one place and I would be going and teaching somebody another place and then I'd be going and picking up something for the gig the following night. And, you know, I would be in my car on the road a lot or I would be, um, you know, taking care of things. We didn't have email back when I was playing in a band. Um, people just called each other on the telephone, but there was a lot of that too. And a lot of rehearsing and a lot of other stuff just to get things perfect. So, yeah. And then it, that has just really become... You know, I mean, if I really plan to sit down and have a proper dinner, I just really have to, uh, you know, even though I do, I have a family now, and we all like to sit down to eat, but I really have to tell myself that I am going to go have dinner, okay? And um, in the real Frank Zappa book, Zappa talks about this as well. You know, he's downstairs working on his stuff, and if the family is having a big Thanksgiving meal, they had to drag him upstairs to have some turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes or whatever. It really is something, the relationship of food to being compulsively artistic is one that is very different. And if you find that happening to you, you may have become a professional musician. Number seven, you improve while doing, not trying. All right, command of your instrument and ease of performance means that a lot of progress is made right on the stage, and rehearsing is becoming more about setting the framework and getting tight. All right, and that is so true because if you're gigging a lot, you know, if you have two different bands 
and you're producing somebody and everything else is just happening to you, then yeah, you know, you get better while you're on stage sometimes. Um, you know, you might have gotten the charts the night before and you might have rehearsed once uh, on this one song and then you better get it right when you are performing. And then as you perform it several times over the next few gigs, then, you know, you get better and better at it because you are seeing it in relationship to the act of performance rather than just the act of rehearsal. Now, how does that apply to orchestration and composing? I think that there is no better way or there is no other way to become a composer. Uh, you know, you in at university, they will try to get you to compose a lot of works that are like, from their perspective, throwaways. And the problem is you have to pour all of your passion into making these works great. Um, and there is something personal at stake. So, you know, you don't have that same perspective that they do. From their perspective, you're just writing this because you are going to get rid of it and it's going to help you become a better composer. But from your perspective, sometimes, even if you understand that, you cannot help but feel attached to everything that you compose. All right. So this is how this applies. As you're composing things that you feel passionate about, you get better and better and better. And then finally, at the end of it, you look back at the things that you felt passionate about and you think, wow, what? boy, was I under the spell of XYZ composer. You know, I tried to write everything like John Williams. I tried to write everything like Maurice Ravel. You have to work through your loves sometimes to find your own influence. And you have to um, work through your technical and theoretical handicaps before you find that place where you want to be in terms of your approach. So don't worry, improve by doing. That's my suggestion. Number eight, you understand what teamwork means. It goes far beyond just knowing your part and trying to stay on the beat. Rather, your playing has evolved into musical relationships and conversations with your ensemble. So, this seems like it just applies to performing in a band, and it is really an important perspective, okay? It's just like knowing how to work in a team. Um, I think that is really important. But here's the application of how that works for an orchestrator. And that is, um, if you want to work in Hollywood, and you want to work your way up the ladder, you better understand what teamwork means. Whether you are just one guy and you are going to do your entire soundtrack for an independent film and it's all going to be sound sets, or whether you are working for some big composer like, say, Marco Beltrami or, or somebody else like that, if you're on his team, then you are going to be one cog in a well-functioning machine. So you better understand you know, how to do your part and how everybody interrelates to everybody else. Okay, so and that all has to do with musical relationships. Number nine, your instrument is worth more than your transport, often far, far more. You've owned your share of used, falling apart vehicles, purchased out of pocket for a few hundred bucks, but you may likely be thousands of dollars in debt for your gear. That is so true, especially for a gigging Californian composer and, um, you know, popular musician as I used to be, I have owned the <laughs> crummiest cars, <laughs> um, you know, with handles falling off, you know, uh, good old Toyota. I once owned five Toyotas in a row and they all had the 20R engine, which just like kept running and running for, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles. And you might be saying, well, geez, you know, if you owned all of those cars and, you know, that engine is so reliable, then how come you went through five different Toyotas? Well, it's because I really drove those cars into the pavement. Um, or I got to the point where the engine had way more miles on it, but the, you know, the actual body of the car and all the things attached to it were just, just so much of a waste that, you know, and it was just so embarrassing to drive it around. Um, the ability to lock the car and have your stuff stay relatively safe inside of it uh, and inconspicuous. Uh, inconspicuousness is actually a better security device than a car alarm. Uh, you know, if, if people see your crummy car and they can't imagine anything in it being worth anything, and as they walk by they don't see anything either, then you're way safer than if you have, like, 
um, um, a recent model car with, you know, a great radio in it and tinted windows and a bunch of other stuff that really attracts attention. doesn't matter whether or not they can see that you've got an amp and a guitar in the back or whatever. Um, it might get, you know, might get stolen just because it looks like a beautiful car. And actually, <laughs> the car that I own now is also a hunk of junk. Um, actually, I mean, I could afford to to have a slightly nicer car now. Not not by much, but still, yeah. I mean, when we ended up buying this car, we bought it for the remodel that I was doing last year, but my wife has fallen in love with it. <laughs> um, might have something to do with that license plate. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> uh, I, I really want to get something nicer, um, but she won't let me. <laughs> She just likes that. She likes this turbo car. I don't know, whatever. Okay, I don't care. Speaking of which, <laughs> number 10, your partner wants to know when you're getting paid. So do you, but you know that to play the game, you have to put up with delays, stalling, and occasional dishonesty before getting what you earned. This is a tricky balance, really, and that is that you kind of learn that you can't push things too hard. And sometimes that just means putting up with people really stalling and, and you know, it is actually good to have your partner saying, when are you going to get paid? When are you going to get paid? Because if you are too much of a wishy-washy kind of person and you don't stand up for your right to get paid, then your partner might as well be saying, you know, hey, when are we going to get some money in this house? And actually, that is a motive. It's not just that old cartoon with the wife talking to the warrior saying, hey, I'm getting sick and tired of people calling you Alexander the Pretty Good. It's more than just that. Um, it, it also has to do with just like learning to be practical, you know, widening your scope of income, learning that, you know, you deserve to get what you worked for and everything else. So if you are not hooked up with somebody right now who is in a domestic situation with you, just let that little voice of conscience inside you speak for you, right? Be your nagging partner saying, would you please go talk to that club owner? Or would you please, you know, write another email to that director or whatever, right? And you kind of have to learn to pace these things. And that is a whole other video. Okay, so let's not get into it now. Number 10. You listen to music analytically. Now that a long playlist of hundreds of songs is stuck in your head and many gigs are behind you, it's gotten hard to just relax and let the music wash over you. And in fact, I would say for orchestrators and composers, you pretty much have to just kiss that music washing over you stuff goodbye. Okay, you can turn it off, right? You can turn off the analytical engine inside your brain. And that's great, but if you never learn to turn it on, then you are in big trouble, okay? And um, <clears throat> somebody asked a question in the group um, a while back, and they wanted to know some basic things about thematic development and harmony and so on and so forth. And yeah, I just had to say, you have to just learn how to listen to the music and think about all the different things that it's doing as it does it, right? Instead of being a passive participant, and, I mean, the problem with that is that you can lose the ability to just enjoy music. And um, that is a quandary, right? You can go too far in the other direction. So, um, I have actually never had that problem uh, or have not had that problem as much. Um, I can turn it on and off. But, um, and actually, I can, I, I can turn it off when I'm listening to my own pieces, which is kind of nice. And um, if you can do that with your own music, then do that. But once again, don't, you know, don't just become like somebody who completely coddles every mistake and everything that they could possibly fix, too, right? You, you know, if, if something needs work, you should be listening analytically to your own music and thinking what you could do to fix it. Okay, number 12. You earn trust from others, dot, 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 taking responsibility for the things you say and do, putting your best out there as far as it can go, and not backstabbing your mates or making empty promises. Okay, um, yeah, and that is really, that is the thing, you know what I mean, about having a career in the arts. And that is that it really is um, results-based, right? You have to just keep putting things out there that 
have a practical purpose and that are worth paying for. I mean, I hate to be so brutally practical about it, but I mean, you know, even the guys who are writing art at the highest level, like, you know, Stravinsky, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, those guys were doing it because that great art was something that could feed them. Okay, so, um, you know, I, that is why I feel that this is not something that compromises your art. You know, you have to find a way to make it work as a career if that is what you're interested in. So, and and I think that it's a good thing. I think that it's not it's not selling out. It is finding a an outlet for your passion and your incredible ideas that you know that has some practical resonance so that you can just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and you don't have to you know go back to washing dishes or you know or whatever um so so yeah uh and and but then you know the further thing that attaches to that is that being responsible for what you promise to do sometimes you can't deliver everything that you have planned and that you have promised um, and in that case, you have to put what your you know, problem is in perspective, but still follow through eventually and, you know, and, and do more, uh, you know, than maybe what you originally promised to kind of smooth things over if you really have let things go. So, yeah, so you just really have to learn to become somebody that people trust. Right. And I think that that is just so important. OK. All right. And that leads right into number 13, dot, dot, dot. And you don't hand your trust out for free because, oh, how you've been burned. And you've seen people turn from saints into rat bags when the going got tough. Counting on trustworthy people has the highest results of getting paid, right? So this is just a practical thing. Is like if we all are working together in ways that build trust, then I feel that the music business gets better, right? And one of the horrible things um, about the music business is that people who are not worthy of trust have wiggled their way into it and, you know, found ways of making zillions of dollars for themselves while the creators get nothing, okay? And that is, once again, a subject for a very long series of videos. Most people watching this video are starting from nothing, and they are slowly building their own musical worlds and musical careers and businesses or just doing it for the love of it, okay? But, you know, working with trustworthy people is so important, right? Because that builds a community of trustworthy people who are doing things, okay? So just think about that. Number 14, you feel more at home on stage than off. In fact, your life is starting to feel like one long performance interrupted by a few breaks to eat, sleep, and change locations. Um, boy, did this um, really become a reality for me at a certain stage of my life. And... It is actually possible to feel like your life is one long jolt of composition, just sort of changing forms and changing pieces, and then the few breaks to eat, sleep, and change locations, or to have a family life, or whatever. It is really easy to just completely lose your whole career in that, so um, watch out. Make sure that the life that you have composing and orchestrating makes the life that you have when you're not composing and orchestrating worth living. Okay, it's really important for the two to work together or to become one thing, right? To become one flow of activity and consciousness. Number 15, you never quite get enough sleep. You get home many nights a month looking and smelling like a crushed cigarette butt. This is before they stopped allowing smoking in the nightclubs, obviously. But if you sleep in, then there won't be any time to practice or go to the dentist's office or whatever. Actually, in my case, this is kind of a slightly schizophrenic thing in my marriage, and that is that I like to get up at 4 a.m. and work and do things and so on. But sometimes my wife is gigging with a job with like an orchestra and a military band and also uh, does enormous amounts of freelance work. So, you know, there might be two or three weeks in a row where she comes home at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. And if I want to have some time with my partner, then I have to stay up too. And that kind of takes away a lot of my most 
productive hours. So I make up for it by like saying doing some work while she is out gigging and after my son has been put to bed. So, you know, like, you know, say from seven to 10. So there's the three hours that I might have been spending from like four to seven in the morning. There are ways of getting around it, but I actually prefer working in the mornings. I can work any time of day. Just whenever I have to do it, I just do it. And that is actually something else I don't think I mentioned in this. But yeah, but just being able to just turn it on and turn it off is a really, really important professional skill if you are a musician. Number 16, you're always thinking weeks and months ahead. In fact, you may be much more focused on planning ahead for future gigs than aware about what's about to happen in a couple of days or even a couple of hours sometimes. Okay, and this really, really does apply to both popular music gigging and to being a composer. And that really has something to do with just setting up the work for yourself. And you know the work that you're doing today may not be as exciting as the anticipation of the work that you have planned, you know, the, the grand scheme of your professional career that's coming up. Um, what a, a lot of people do not realize about the way that things work for film composers is the guy at the top who is doing a lot of the composition is also the guy who is hustling work. You know, they might spend their mornings, you know, six hours working on two to three minutes of a sound to picture, you know, say on a DAW, and then that gets orchestrated by, uh, you know, by his assistants, and then spend the afternoon calling around and, you know, getting things ready to, like, maybe fly out to London to record with the LSO or making sure that this, that, or the other administrative thing is taken care of or calling a director and just sort of making sure that they've got work for the next year for their team, right? Because, you know, you it's like having a family. You have to support them all and then you have to make sure that they have work and everything else. So that's where thinking months and weeks and years ahead really, really comes into the picture. So I'm not in that position myself, but I have some friends who are, um, who work in some of these um, configurations, some of these teams. The most capable film composers sometimes are the best administrators. Not all composers work with this model, like, you know, John Williams and so on and so forth. But anyhow. Number 17, you have a lot of weird clothes. Mostly things you like to wear on stage. This is different depending which style you play, but your distinction between street clothes and stage clothes is now invisible compared to most other people. Um, we don't have to go into this too much. I think that musicians just like to dress in, in fun ways. You know, I think we're less inhibited than other people. And actually, if you are a concert musician, you've got like a lot of black clothing and you just end up wearing black a lot because like half of your rack just might be black concert clothing. In my case, I played with a lot of goth bands and a lot of, you know, psychedelic bands that were sort of slightly new romantic. And so I had a lot of things with buckles and zippers and <laughs> weird kind of stuff, which don't fit me anymore. So I have an excuse not to wear them. Yeah, it's not really important in the perspective, I think, this particular thing, but whatever. It's just fun. Number 18, you've stopped partying so much. For a working musician, a party is a job, where the focus of many is upon a few. You're starting to prefer smaller gatherings where you know and trust everyone, and you're appreciated on your own personal merits. Okay, and that is something that relates back to being tired of being admired. Um, and that is just basically, yeah, you know, a party is a job to me. If I go to an immense do you know, and everybody is having fun, and they're dancing, and they're getting smashed, and they're laughing their heads off, and I don't know anybody. My instinct is, I belong on the bandstand. I should be sitting in the corner with a piano playing some Gershwin, or some of my own stuff that fits the uh, occasion. Yeah, you know, that's where I feel I belong at a huge party. But like smaller gatherings where like, say, everybody's a composer and we're all hanging out and having fun or just like a bunch of friends not related to music, if I had any. I'm seeing more and more situations where not just me, but other composers um, kind of prefer this if they are really working a lot. There is enough chaos. There's enough noise. There's enough stuff going on. Uh, but, you know, everybody's different. I have another friend who is the life of the party. I was at a birthday party 
of a musician and people were sort of trying out different uh, musical instruments, one of which was a bugle, this beautiful old bugle from the First World War. And the uh, birthday girl uh, picked up the bugle and she played the most beautiful announcing type of call on it. And in walks my composer friend. You know, I mean, he's just that kind of guy. His timing (laughs) is perfect. And he is just like... If there is a big social gathering or a big kind of thing, he is there, and that is what he thrives on. So, anyways. But not me. I am the nerd at the party. Okay, number 19. You know most of the people in your scene, the want-to-bes and might-have-beens, the ones who seem to grind their gears and the ones who've moved on. Most important, you know the people worth working with and working for. Okay, and this is actually a slightly tragic thing. Okay, Um, and this relates to the Northern California scene in the late 70s through the mid 80s. I knew people who had played in bands where their bandmates had gone on to uh, be really, really big. And I knew people who had played like the occasional subbing gig in some of those bands that were starting to take off. I mean, I remember when Huey Lewis played in a band called Clover. Okay, that is how old I am. I remember Y and T when they were known as Yesterday and Today. So, I mean, I remember that scene. Um, I remember certain local bands being unable to do nightclub gigs anymore. So they would just um, go play at the park free for all of their friends who had been in the scene supporting them when they were a nightclub act, right? And that way they could just play music all day and drink a little, party a little, hang out with all of their friends and, and everything else. And if they were to play a serious gig, it would be, say, at the Coliseum in Oakland. But this little personal gig was just something, was their way of touching their roots, right? And so so I remember all of these things from back then. And I think that there is a correlation a little bit to composing and orchestrating. But the thing about composing and orchestrating is that it is more of a personal quest than it is a collective one with other bandmates. Um, and the scene that you create can sometimes just be your own personal thing um, that, that goes in and out of more professional stuff going on that relates to you in personal ways as well as professional ones and, and so on and so forth. So I don't really like to think of people being might-have-beens and has-beens. I think you are just a human being, okay? <laughs> so... Um, and you are just putting your art out there and whichever pathway it takes, whether it's professional or amateur or personal or or whatever, it can be incredibly rewarding. I mean, if I had a day job and I had to stay in that day job and I had absolutely no choice, like, you know, let's say that I was, um, there was a war happening and I was, um, you know, I was a military officer and but I still loved my composing. Say like maybe one of the mighty five. A lot of those were a lot of those guys were civil servants and military officers. You know, if I had to defend my country and um, I had to stay in the service, then I would still be composing and trying to create whatever I could. Whether it was hanging out with some other people and creating a national music scene, like the mighty five or something, I would be doing that. So I don't like to divide things into the winners and losers with orchestration and composition. I just don't think that that makes any sense. When there is a local scene where people are paying you to gig and um, you work your way up this um, imaginary ladder of accomplishments, then that actually makes more sense of people being winners and losers. But I still hate to think that way. I hate to think of a person putting their art out there and being thought of as a loser. I I think that that is just, just an awful way to think. Yeah, as you notice, I don't use that word (laughs) in this particular uh, feature, right? But like knowing everybody in your scene, that is really something that starts to happen when you have some kind of local music thing happening, okay? And this is another reason for the strong argument that I put forward in in the Getting Performed video that I did for the intro series, is just knowing who is out there and who is playing works and who is interested in it and who's had enough developing composers with scores and and crazy ideas to put on a gig at a gallery um, or people who really want to do that. Um, You know, I, I, I remember going to a performance recently where I heard a couple of friends playing trombone and harp duos and and it was amazing, and, and and it was just really complex music. And at the end, I walked up to the harpist, and I said, you know, wow, just that was such an accomplishment. She said, oh, yeah, you know, it was fun to put this together for a couple of weeks. And 
I just really realized that to her, you know, even though learning a harp score is a bit more complicated than the average instrument, she just really looked at it as something that she enjoyed doing and was willing to do. So that is an example of, you know, reaching out and knowing the scene. And so, and I actually intend to work with her soon, um, if possible. So um, number 20, we're getting close to the end of our list. You often avoid mentioning you're a musician when you're meeting new people or casually chatting with strangers. This helps keep the conversation from always shifting to you and what you're doing, which is becoming a bit of a bore to repeat all the time. And honestly, this is really true when you get to be an oldie like me, you know, at 55. I guess that's, for 55 is like equivalent of maybe age 30 in musician terms. If you are a 28-year-old violinist, you are like the equivalent of like 70 years old, right? If you haven't like completely had a career by then, um, then you're not going to be suddenly discovered and turned into this virtuoso that tours, right? You know, that is just basically, you know, or if you're a ballet dancer and you're 28 years old, you know, that is kind of almost looking towards the end of your career. But if you are a composer and you're 28, you're like maybe six years old. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's a good thing, I think, about composing is you can continue to be an irresponsible youth for, you know, all the way into your 60s uh, and still be thought of as young. I can recall being in my 40s and being referred to as the young composer by a bunch of guys who were in their 70s. But to get back to the article, I don't like being the composer in the neighborhood. I mean, this is a really safe city and a safe neighborhood and everything. And, you know, everybody's got uh, what I've got pretty much, computers and stuff in, in every house. And I, there's really nothing that exceptional about me. So it's not like I'm trying to hide the fact to protect my equipment or anything. On the other hand, just how boring is it to just talk about me all the time? You know what I mean? Because it's like to explain what we do just takes forever. People are working in offices. People are working in banks. People are working in restaurants. And there is enough of that culture going around that everybody kind of realizes, you know, if they say, oh, you know, I'm a teller at a bank or, you know, oh, I'm a chef at a, uh, at a restaurant, people kind of understand what's going on. If you say, oh, I'm a composer, it sort of like stops everything dead because everybody thinks that that is something really big and a big special deal. Or they think that you are just a BS artist. <laughs> You know, oh, you know, oh, you're a composer, huh? Well, half the people in the Manhattan phone book will claim to be a composer if you call them, you know. It's not really pretentious to say you're a composer, especially if, you, if in my case, I can say, well, I'm the education composer in residence for Orchestra Wellington. So, I mean, it's a real job working with a real orchestra, or I can mention orchestration online or something, but I just l don't like to go into it. You know what I mean? Because it's just, I mean, it's a lot to explain. It's the same explanation over and over again. And it also sort of puts the other person at a bit of a disadvantage if they're not doing something artistic. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, it doesn't make me feel great <clears throat> to brag about what a great composer I am or how connected I am or, or what I'm doing. You know, once again, I am not special. The people who are special are the people who are taking the huge risks to become artistic and possibly professional. All right, those people are special. You know, not to go over this too much, I don't say, hey, I'm a composer to everybody I meet, okay, because they're not going to get me anywhere with my career, right? Just in a practical sense, I'm a person who lives next door, okay? And if we get to know each other a little bit better, I might talk about my music if it's something that's relevant to what we're talking about. But otherwise, you know... But I found that the people who are the least professional are the people who are running around screaming about their art the most to people who don't care. All right, that's my two cents. Number 21, you've got a built-in time waster detector, which kicks in when you meet people who want to use a piece of you to help themselves get further or make themselves feel important or bury you in the quicksand of their incompetence. <laughs> And boy, have I run into people like that in the music business. Um, and I don't want to say especially in California, because there are people like that everywhere, but especially in California, <laughs> in LA and San Francisco, where there's a lot happening. Sometimes that attracts people who are just really in it for themselves. They don't really care about you. If they see that you are somebody that they can use to get to the top, then they will just use you. And that's really a different thing from wanting to succeed in a sincere way with a music career. 
but it doesn't really matter what the motives are. What really matters is that people are wasting your time, right? Is that you get nothing out of it. You don't move forwards with your own music, and they do. If you're in a band and everybody is miserable but them, right? Um, here's, here's an example of a time waster. I did a lot of um, producing of young bands here just in an educational way in Wellington. And I worked with a lot of people who were going semi-professional. And I sent one of my graduates to an audition and she made it into a band being the lead vocalist of this particular thing. And she was great. Uh, she fit the band perfectly well. And then they got a keyboardist who actually stylistically did not fit the band, um, except for whenever the music was focused around him and his songwriting and keyboard playing, okay? And he had a pretty good voice, I have to say. He could have led that band. And he campaigned for months and months and months to get her kicked out of the band, okay? And just worked on it and worked on it. And he finally, finally got them to get rid of her, and then he quit the band, that made me so mad. And usually I don't get personally upset about things, but, you know, she was a protege of mine. And now she's running a media company, <laughs> you know, and who knows where that guy is, you know, probably washing dishes somewhere. Um, but here is this person who's obviously what she eventually did with her career was going to bring everybody with her and was going to lift all boats. And all this guy did was waste everybody's time. Right? It wasted her time to be in that band while he was in there and causing her emotional distress. And it wasted the band's time because they could have gone farther with my uh, graduate than they, than they did with him, obviously. Because after he kicked her out of the band and then quit, then the band fell apart because they had nobody to lead them. Right, So that's just one example of hundreds <laughs> that I could tell you about people I've run into and eventually learned to avoid. Okay, but try to develop a good time waster detector. Okay, number 22. This sort of relates to that. You've learned to say no to some offers for gigs, even good ones at times, realizing all too well what happens to you personally, professionally, and artistically when you overcommit. Okay, well, this is kind of a tough one because um, if you develop your speed to a certain point, um, like, say, like speed of scoring, which is um, one of the things that I've developed, like workflows through Sibelius, and I have whole courses on this. Um, then, and, and you also like develop your inner ear and a bunch of other things to where you can solve problems that it might take somebody else days to figure out. You know, if you get all of these things to where you can just do work faster and faster and faster, then <clears throat> you don't have to say no as much, right? And then eventually, not having to say no over and over again adds up to a career. But look, you know, if you're not ready for all that work at all that speed, it is okay. It is okay to do smaller amounts of work in a better way than to not turn anybody down and then disappoint everyone. Okay. So, um, so learn to say no earlier in your career as a musician is my advice. Okay. Um, and the thing about it is, don't say no in a way that closes the door, right? Here's a good strategy. If you have to say no, try to set something up with them for the future, right? And it might turn out that actually they cannot do the project with you just yet, right? So they might, it might be March, and they might say, hey, can you do this in April? And you say, oh, geez, well, I'm really busy in April. Um, you know, I'm going to be touring and I'm going to be doing X, Y, Z. Um, can we do this in June? Um, and they might say, oh, geez, well, I better find somebody else. And you say, well, like, I really, you know, I've been looking forward to working with you or I remember working with you last year and it was just really incredible. So if there's any way for me to jump onto that project later or for us to do a different project in the future, um, Let's try it out. And you might have all these ideas, too, that, you know, that you run by them and saying, hey, you know, like, um, you know, I've got this um, new approach that I'm developing and I want to work with somebody and use kind of like these really beautiful spectral types of sounds and give them a CD of it or, or send them a link or something. Um, and then they try to get their act together and it's July <laughs> and you've got nothing to do. And they finally have the funding, which they thought that they had, you know, back in April. And they say, hey, 
I've been listening to that CD you gave me. Let's do it, right? So, so, so when you say no, don't close the door and try to build on on the wonderful opportunity you've been offered when somebody comes to you with a project, okay? The other thing too is you will have to say yes to a lot of people when you barely have the time and you have to learn how to deal with it, all right? So don't overcommit, right? If you really know that you're overcommitting, then don't do that. But learn how to add more and more to your roster of, of gigs and learn how to cope with the added work is my suggestion on that. But still, when there is just not enough time, you have to say no. Number 23, you know what goodwill means. The personal value of what you do and how you connect as a human being to other people around you. For those who really care and want to make music to continue, it's a chain of good deeds that connects us all. Okay, and this kind of goes back a little bit to what I was saying before about, you know, teamwork and, um, you know, not handing out your trust for free and working with people who are trustworthy and so on and so forth. But goodwill isn't just about being trustworthy. Okay, goodwill is really something that, that really means that you are in this for the sake of making things better, right, rather than making things worse. Um, I've had students before... The only purpose I was achieving by being their teacher was to be something of a role model to them, and that was really where their parents were coming from. It was much more than the art. This person did not have really good adult male role models. Um, so, you know, I mean, that is a kind of goodwill in a way, um, and that is that you are somebody in the community, whether it's artistic or whether it's, you know, somewhat public, like if you're, say, if you are a teacher at a music store or some other kind of thing. Um, and if you are doing things because you love it and you want people to love what you do and you want them to interact and you and you want to create uh, communities of people around your music and around other musicians, um, those are all really goodwill things. You know, you, you don't want to just go into this by yourself or else you end up one of those time wasters, right? And you end up being somebody like that. So you don't want that. So yeah. But yeah, but connecting good deeds together, right? And that, that doesn't mean just giving everything away for free. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Um, there are ways that you can do things that are purely professional that are good deeds in, in and of themselves. In fact, like the more work that you do in a righteous way, you know, the better everything improves. The perception of who we are as composers, the artistic missions that we might have, and everything else, right? That just, like, being in it for a good reason, right? Rather than just saying, I want to be the next John Williams, right? Well, there already is a John Williams, okay? Be the next you and do maybe what John Williams did to create more of a better dialogue and, and you know, a a new perception about the way that film music can be and the way that relationships between directors and film composers can be. Number 24, you pay it forward because you clearly remember how people took the time and patience to explain how things worked when you were starting out. They could see how just a few words of advice could make the difference between your success and failure. Now, as you've gained experience, you can see with their eyes and take the time to help someone else out when the situation arises. So there is a way of rushing this, all right? Um, I've seen in the community people get really interested in certain topics, and it's not just the orchestration online community, but just the YouTube community in general, that people will have a passion for a topic and possibly you know try to do instructional videos or, or outreach type videos before they have actually accomplished a whole lot themselves. Um, and, you know, like, I cannot fault them for their passion and for their desire to do that, right? Um, but, yeah, but there's something about it that has to do with credibility, right? So, so if you have been the object of people paying things forward, then you, then you owe it to those people who paid it forward to pay it forward to the next person. That's just what this is about, right? So I would say that, like, when you have accumulated that kind of support and that kind of perspective... And you see a lot of people having perspectives and particular outlooks that you feel are not productive, then it's kind of nice to like reach out and share what helped you, 
right? That is actually helping you with your existing career, with your existing aspirations, right? Because that is really where it comes from. So pay it forward, right? Instead of paying it back, right? Because there's nothing you can do to help somebody who is already a professional, right? Unless they kind of get down on their luck or something. But yeah, it's, it's better for you to just help to create um, an ongoing musical conversation with people who might actually be your age or even older than you who are on the same path as you um, and might not know certain things. They might actually be more advanced than you in certain ways, but they might not have had certain practical experiences, right? So, so yeah, so I mean, you can do that by making, you know, YouTube videos or, or Facebook communities, or you can just do it by, you know, volunteering to help out high school students, right? I mean, there's ways of doing this. Um, that don't have to involve a lot of money or a lot of effort, but just kind of helping other people. Okay, number 25, we've reached our last sign that you may have become a professional musician. And <clears throat> it goes like this, slowly, piece by piece, your career has been taking apart your steady job. You went from full-time to part-time as the gigs got more dependable. Then more freelance work started coming in. Teaching lessons, commercial recording, arranging charts, playing solo gigs, and so on. Eventually, you had to give up the part-time job as well, or maybe you're just down to a few hours a week. But no matter how dicey the music business can be, and how much of a juggling act your finances have become, you wouldn't trade it for a hefty raise punching the clock. You've never been more personally involved in something in your life. You have a job with built-in rewards of satisfaction and appreciation, a thrilling risk factor, and a direct role in shaping and communicating the culture of our time. That's what makes it all worthwhile, being able to earn not only a living, but also the kind of fulfillment that you can't slap a dollar value on. Okay, so what I'd like to say about this is that this is going to happen as I say, probably slowly and gradually. And one of the reasons why I wrote this article in the first place is because I wanted people to understand that they might not even realize that they are becoming a professional musician. That, you know, if they had a checklist of things where they started to realize, hey, you know, um, I am starting to avoid mentioning that I'm a musician. Um, my partner wants to know when I'm getting paid. Um, yeah, wow, understand, like, what teamwork means, I'm eating like a scavenger, I cut to the cash, you know, some of these make sense to me, and I hope that some of them make sense to you, okay, but it is a process that's gradual, so that is why this was made, so you could kind of see, well, you know, maybe some of these other things are going to become more manifest in, you know, my career um, as I go, so I should watch out for those almost as a touchstone to see if you are going in the right direction or, you know, of course, what do I know? You know, I'm, I'm just one person with one career. I'm sure that other pros could add some of their own perspectives. And actually, you know, please do, if you can think of a number 26 or 27 or 28 uh, of indications that you are becoming a, or have become a professional musician, possibly even without realizing it, please add it below. But the only thing that I'm going to really say about number 25 is how many times I have rebuilt my professional career or my career has come out of my other career. And um, part of this has to do with the fact that I am constantly stirring, you know, dozens of different little pots. Some of those pots are clients, um, just ongoing relationships with them. Some of them are kind of one-off things that um, may lead to other things, but with other people. Uh, some of them are just, um, you know, profile, like uh, things that I'm doing that um, increase my visibility with potential clients or other things. Some of them are just kind of like a free-formed, free-fall uh, approach where I'm, you know, kind of striking out in the direction that interests me the most for the period of life that I'm in. So, for instance... Um, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be what I am today, okay? I wanted to be an orchestral composer and arranger. That is where my head was at. I was reading scores. I was reading orchestration books. I was orchestrating things and composing things. That's where what I wanted to be. Now, of course, I also really loved playing the piano, and um, 
you know, I'm not going to say that I was a brilliant virtuoso, but I wanted to be a brilliant virtuoso, and I practiced the hell out of a bunch of things. You know, I learned a few concertos, and I was really heading in that direction at around age 16, and then I started gigging, because that's where the money was. I mean, nobody was going to go pay to hear a 16-year-old, you know, play with a hired orchestra, right? Um, and if And maybe if, you know, that would take a lot of money, which I didn't have. I was very poor at the time. And... Um, so, you know, it, it was much easier to join, you know, my first band, they had their own keyboard and they just needed a keyboardist. So, you know, I helped them out and then I eventually bought my own gear, um, or borrowed it and just kept gigging around and playing with people and so on and so forth. And I did that for steadily for, oh, geez, over the span of about eight or nine years with a couple of, you know, I, I also was a teenager and, and a young adult and I went traveling and, you know, just bumming around uh, the Pacific Northwest for a while and so on. I wasn't just really focused on my career like that. But yeah, but I eventually came back to composing. And um, also I had my chops as a pianist. So for a while I was I was doing, you know, concertizing in a, in a very informal way, just like playing recitals and putting musicians together and doing concerts and, um, you know, promoting my own music when I could and composing music and recording and producing and, and all of that for a while. And then just, you know, after age 35, I just got really, really serious about, um, about what I was doing and eventually you know, got to the point where I was, I had established myself as an orchestral composer and arranger in California and New Zealand. And then, you know, um, growing out of that, um, I just on a whim, after moving to Wellington, I started a holiday program for, uh, for teen musicians. And the whole idea was to teach them professional, um, uh, professional skills, you know, not to jump around, um, like, you know, Jack Black and be silly and, you know, have this school of rock comedy, but to actually do what a lot of very serious musicians are doing in terms of mentoring teens. And, you know, I, I got it all the way up to a, um, to the level where they were actually playing with an orchestra, like a crossover gig. And, you know, and then, um, my wife and I decided to have a baby and, um, that world ended and I took a year off or two to, um, you know, to help raise my son. And, you know, out of that year came the Orchestration Online community, you know, first with videos, then the Facebook group, and then everything else that's come with it. And, and, you know, and my career came back as a, as an orchestral composer and arranger. And, um, you know, so, so I'm not saying, I'm not going over this just to like brag about myself and talk about my career, but what I'm doing is I'm trying to show you that, um, who you are as a musician will change and the situation that you're in will change and the opportunities that are available to you will change. And you will just have to keep changing with those opportunities and you may end up, you know, rebuilding your career over and over again with different audiences, with different people in different situations. I mean, actually, look at the career of Villa Lobos. I mean, how he, um, you know, he was like playing in, you know, little bands and playing for silent films. And then he became a big guy in his country. And then he went to Paris and all he had was just a reputation. And then he rebuilt himself there. And then he, people still remembered him in Brazil, but he was not like, you know, the big thing anymore. But then he came back and then he rebuilt a career there as an educator and as a presence in the country and kind of like a, um, you know, a, uh, a symbol of that uh, country's achievement, for better or worse, um, in the 40s and 50s. So it just happens all the time. I mean, let's let's talk about Beethoven. You know, uh, Beethoven wanted to model his career after Mozart. So he came to Vienna and he spent, you know, uh, the better part of a decade establishing himself as a performer more than a composer. And the compositions that he composed were designed to highlight his accomplishments as a performer more than anything else. Um, but of course, he did write works along the model of the growing interest in chamber music, the growing interest in solo piano, um, you know, for dedicated amateurs and semi-professionals. 
and so on. And then when his, that time in his life was over, he just went into just straight composition. And even just as a composer, he reinvented himself like two or three times. And people call this like the early period, the middle period, and the final period. And some people feel that that is all a bunch of hogwash. But if you really look at the opportunities and the sets of clients that he had um, in terms of people who were patronizing him with uh, just cash donations for being a genius and for you know staying in the area, or people who were, you know, his publishers and those relationships and, you know, people who were willing to perform and premiere his works. That all changed over his life. So that is going to have to change for you if you want a career in this very strange business. And one of the beautiful things and also the most terrifying things about being a professional composer and orchestrator is that... Um, it is different for every different person because every part of this world is a different place. Every opportunity is a different one that comes to every different composer with a different life, right? So what would be a successful career for me might not fit my best friend, you know, uh, who, is a, who is a really, I feel, is one of the greatest composers of all time, um, you know, living in Southern California. So, you know, it's just whatever we're capable of doing and what we've got to offer the world. And if that offering can pay the bills, you know, or can be something where we put our art and our effort out there and it helps, you know, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people out there. We don't know. Okay. So anyways, not to get all serious on you there, <laughs> but um, that is my list of 25 little signs that you may have become a professional musician. <laughs> okay, well, wow, that was a long video. Well, the day is just getting better and better out there, and I want to go get some of it on my 55th birthday. So thank you, everybody, um, for viewing my channel, for adding me such great comments, for supporting me on Patreon, and for being such an awesome community on Facebook and on Twitter. And uh, anyways, I just... I just feel like the luckiest orchestration teacher in the world. So anyways, more really fun stuff coming soon, and I'll see you then. <laughs>